Victorian because he was um, the symposium in honor of Valerie Cromwell. Um, my name is Carla Heller, I'm the director of the Institute of Historical Research, and it's really a delight to see as many of you here today, um, given the circumstances um, as they are. Um, I just wanted to open by just welcoming um, everybody to the Institute today. Um, I'm looking forward to the discussions that we're going to have. I know that there will be um, words said about Valerie um, across the day, and then the Phillips Committee will say some words shortly. Um, I just wanted to add that I came to the Irish Health in Sussex, um, where Valerie did spend a um, significant part of her career. And even though she had long left Sussex when I arrived, um, she was much talked about um, as a presence um, within the history department. Um, so it's a, a personal um, as well as a professional delight um, to be at this symposium today. I'm not going to hand over to Helen. Thank you, thank you very much, Claire. Um, and uh, welcome to, to all of you to uh, the special symposium in honour of Rani Cromwell, uh, co convened by the Institute of Historical Research, History of Policy, and History of Parliament. Um, uh, my name is Philip Murphy, I'm Director of History and Policy here at the IHR. Um, it, I, I'm sure that, that um, that Valerie herself and uh, her husband, Sir John Kingman, want me to begin by acknowledging recent events, the very sad news of the death of Her Majesty the, the Queen, um, which has thrown out all our plans. So I'm particularly grateful to everyone uh, for turning up to, to honor Valerie in this way today. Um, Many of us, most of us, I suspect, are in one way or another students of political, constitutional history. And some of us will be specialists to a degree on the institution of the monarchy itself. And as such, we're all in a particular position to realize what an extraordinary achievement the Queen's reign was. And indeed, um, she showed us that you could be extraordinary whilst at the same time being, in a sense, remarkably modest and unassuming. Um, there, there have been lots of stories about her rehearsed in recent days. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with the one. I think it was about Claire Short in the early days of the, the, the new Labour government when Claire Short was meeting the Queen and Claire Short's mobile phone suddenly went off. And without missing a beat, the Queen just said to her, oh, really, you should answer it. It might be someone important. <laughs> and I think that was, in, in, in a way, her own, her own attitude to herself. And uh, she helped us to define the notion of a public servant. Um, in a way that maybe we're losing touch with in public life at the moment. Someone for whom political office is there to serve the, the nation and the people rather than to serve oneself. And I think we will all miss her very much. Um, but our main uh, purpose today is to remember Valerie Cromwell, um, who many of you will have known personally who died in 2018. We are very proud to, uh, to name her as a, an alumnus of both the University of London and the Institute of Historical Research. Uh, she studied history at King's College London and Sir Michael Howard. She then undertook postgraduate research here at the, the IHR under Dame Lillian Penson. Her first academic post was at Bedford College, the University of London, before she moved to Newnham College, Cambridge. And as Claire mentioned, Daisy Briggs then recruited her to the newly created University of Sussex, where she taught from 1964 to 1991. She published a monograph, The Revolution or Evolution, British Government in the 19th Century, and a co-authored book, Aspects of, Aspects of Government in the 19th, in 19th Century Britain. And on leaving Sussex in 1991, she became 
general editor and later director of History of Parliament. She's also widely remembered for her international role um, in the International Committee of Historical Sciences, on which she served as Secretary General. Um, in her retirement, uh, she served as High Sheriff of Bristol from 2004 to 2005. Um, she is very, very warmly remembered, I know, and Claire's already mentioned this, and I'm sure people will have reason to refer to over the course of this day. Um, this event was uh, made possible by a very generous donation by her husband, Sir John Kingman, who was hoping to be with us today, but the logistics, partly because of the, the nature of London at the moment, have unfortunately defeated him. He, he's um, sad that he can't attend, but we are recording this event. And so, hopefully, he will go to, to uh, watch the proceedings uh, at his leisure. Um, this event has also been made possible with a kind collaboration of um, Paul Seward, Philip Salmon, and their colleagues in History of Parliament, who helped to put this, this remarkable program together. Um, very grateful to our own events team, led by Jenna Dormer, as I say, we will be recording this, uh, this symposium. We'll only make that recording available, obviously, with everyone's consent uh, at the end. Brief housekeeping. The exit is the way you came in, uh, through SAS and the, the north entrance to Senate House. Lunch will be next door. Reception at the end of the day will be upstairs in the common room. So without further ado, let me introduce our first panel, and we have three speakers, all from, appropriate enough, from History of Parliament. Uh, Dr. Philip Salmon, uh, who joined History of Parliament in 1997, worked on the 1820-1832 uh, History of Commons volumes, uh, which were published in 2009. Uh, he was then appointed editor of the 1832-1868 House of Commons project. He's author of Electoral Reform at Work, Local Politics and National Parties, 1832-1841. Speaking with him is Dr. Martin Speichel, who joined History of Parliament in 2016 and is a research fellow on the 1832-1945 project. He's currently researching the biographies of MPs in London, Devonshire, Cornwall, and Scotland. He's the author of a forthcoming monograph, which we hope to see next year, uh, Mapping the State, Geography, Representation, and the, 19, uh, the 1832 Reform Act. And finally on this panel, uh, we have Dr. Catherine Ricks, who joined History of Parliament in 2009. Uh, she's assistant editor of the House of Commons, 1832 to 1945, and she's author of Parties, Agents, and Electoral Culture in England, 1880 to 1910. So, without further ado, let me uh, ask uh, Philip Sandler to give our first presentation. Yeah. I've added one extra question to my title, which you'll see on the uh, program. Uh, so the first two questions are sort of introductory, and the last thing, uh, the last one I've added is how did the secret ballot affect voting behavior? Uh, there are a few um, extra things to say about that on the basis of some more recent research I did in the run-up to uh, obviously uh, preparing this paper. So the secret ballot, which we're celebrating the 150th anniversary of this year, is obviously considered to be one of the major electoral reforms 19th century, uh, alongside extending the vote to ever wider sections of the population, including eventually, of course, women, the introduction of equal size constituencies and limits on election uh, spending, secret voting is usually seen as a key improvement in the UK's representative system, uh, particularly in terms of obviously tackling corruption and the coercion of voters by employees and uh, landlords. Now, the fact that the popular view of 19th century elections uh, particularly as satirised by Dickens or 
more recently Black Hammer's say Dunny on the Wald, is one of alcoholic excess, disorderly behaviour and bribery, has only tended to make the move to secret voting, I think, seem more significant and necessary. We're all familiar with this negative but often highly entertaining depiction of Victorian polls and the many amusing anecdotes that accompany accounts of old-style electioneering. Joseph Grego, of course, making full use of his personal collection of satirical cartoons, was one of the first to make a small fortune out of this whole genre with his hugely popular book, Elections in the Old Days, written just a decade after the end of public voting. And on our own uh, Victorian Commons blog, where we highlight the research of the 1832-68 project, blogs about voter corruption, bribery, treating and drink, uh, such as this one here, are also consistent crowd-pleasers, attracting many more views than other topics that we write about. So this very bawdy image of Victorian elections held in a public voting system clearly continues to be extremely popular and pervasive. The problem with this view, though, is that it's extremely misleading, I think, in terms of the operation of the public voting system as a whole. Our ongoing work researching every election held between 1832 and 1868 in all the UK's 401 constituencies has unearthed a very different picture. But yes, people could be pressurised and intimidated to vote a certain way. And yes, bribery and corruption existed and were certainly aided and abetted by the fact that everybody's voting behaviour before 1872 was public knowledge. But the scale of these problems was limited, with more publicity usually being given to breaches of acceptable conduct rather than routine behaviour. Indeed, the press in many ways was just as guilty as historians of being focusing on the most colourful and corrupt components of Victorian electioneering, often sensationalising stories to maximise their readership. And this, I think, helps to explain one of the striking dilemmas about the secret ballot. Why, if the Victorian public voting system was so bad and so unpopular, did it take so long for secret voting to be introduced? Some radical campaigners, of course, had been pushing for the secret ballot since the 1820s. But during the debates on the 1832 Reform Bill, virtually every shade of politician, Whigs, Reformers, Tories, and even many radicals, queued up to defend public voting, ensuring that any proposals to include it were dropped. Now, one of the most common arguments made in favour of public voting, both then and over the ensuing decades, was, of course, public accountability. The idea that the vote was a trust or a duty that had to be exercised publicly in order to ensure that it was carried out properly. As the Prime Minister Palmerston, expressing the views, I think, of all the party leaders at the time, explained in 1858, an individual is invested with the power of voting not for his own personal advantage or interest, but for the interest and advantage of the nation, to be exercised in perfect daylight and be open to the criticism of our friends and neighbours and the public at large. And most of the early Victorian MPs that we're researching held similar views. Uh, speaking on the hustings at the 1859 election, for instance, the Berkshire MP, Captain Lester Vernon, declared, damn the secret ballot, give me the bold-faced Englishman who, with his hat on one side, swaggers up to the polling booth, and when the clerk says, for whom do you vote, answers manfully and in the face of his neighbours. <laughs> Now, this sort of openness, of course, was especially important at a time when only a limited number of people could vote. Rather than being completely excluded from the electoral process, non-electors could see and judge how everyone had polled. As a result, as our constituency articles show, non-electors often played a very prominent part in trying to influence how voters behaved. Uh, women, in particular, feature frequently in surviving canvassing books and electioneering papers with comments like, wife says he will vote, or sister promised, testifying to their role. And their role as influencers also helps to explain why they are so prominent in most depictions of open-air election scenes from the mid-Victorian period, including nice early photographs like this one here. But women, of course, were not the only type of non-elector. Uh, working men, including all those disfranchised by the voting restrictions of the 1832 Reform Act, often played a significant role setting up meetings and pressure groups to persuade voters and trying to influence shopkeepers or traders in a practice known as exclusive dealing. And this was not considered as inappropriate or unconstitutional as it might seem today. And many MPs deliberately targeted their campaigns at non-electors as well as voters. 
Even some of the radical chartists, famous of course for their six points, including manhood suffrage with the secret ballot, accepted that public voting gave at least some power to the unenfranchised. Fergus O'Connor actually called secret voting a mask on an honest face in his newspaper, The Northern Star, warning that its introduction would stop scrutiny into the acts of your trustees and destroy deference to popular opinion. Another vocal advocate of public voting was the so-called schoolmaster of liberalism, J.S. Mill, whose thoughts on parliamentary reform, published in 1859, staunchly defended the moral virtues of an entirely public voting system. And as these and so many other quotes and speeches from supporters of public voting from across the political spectrum show, voters were not only expected to be held accountable to public opinion, but were also encouraged to act on behalf of their neighbours and communities when casting their votes. As one MP explained during an 1841 campaign, the vote is public property. The elector is only a trustee, and you, the non-electors, have the right to scrutinise and to direct the voters' choice. Now, I say votes in plural there because another overlooked factor that helped to underpin this concept of voters representing non-voters was that most electors in England at this time didn't just have one vote, but had two. And owing to the predominance of double member constituencies in England, which returned two MPs, 96% of the English electorate had two votes at their disposal during the 1832 to 68 period. And comments like, I give one vote for myself and one for my neighbour, or I cast my first vote for the Duke and my second for my interests, litter the election inquiries of this period. One particularly common form of behaviour linked to public voting was what contemporaries termed one and one voting. Now before looking at this though, given what I've said about the positive benefits associated with public voting at the time, and I could list many more, it is worth briefly noting why secret voting was introduced, how it has to be asked, did the act we're marking the anniversary of actually get passed? Well, it certainly wasn't because of a hugely successful campaign waged by radical MPs in Parliament. Ballot motions only passed the Commons in very thin houses when the bulk of MPs were absent. And before Gladstone, as Prime Minister, took up the cause in 1868-9, the number of MPs supporting the ballot never topped the tally achieved on the 18th of June 1839, when 216 MPs voted in its support, but over half as many again, 333 against. It also wasn't because of the mass mobilisation or organisation of popular opinion out of doors, of the kind, say, waged against the Corn Laws. The ballot did become a popular demand in the 1830s, we'll be hearing about later, especially in larger constituencies after the 1835 and 37 elections. And there was a ballot society in existence from 1853 to 65. But this was never really an issue that galvanised the entire nation. Even in the 1868 election, held after the dramatic extension of the franchise by the Second Reform Act, surprisingly few candidates actively called for the secret ballot in their election campaigns. As Disraeli correctly noted in his famous 1871 speech against the ballot, drawing on what for him some unusually accurate statistical work he'd carried out, <laughs> only 151 of the MPs elected in 1868, so this is barely a quarter of the Commons, were signed up supporters of the ballot, according to their election addresses, speeches, or previous votes. So why was secret voting introduced? Well, as a number of historians have noted, the introduction of this particular reform was very much a ministerial initiative. In other words, high politics, taken up by Gladstone in order to satisfy new cabinet colleagues like John Bright and his Home Secretary, Henry Bruce. It was, as the Tory MP for Cambridge University, Beresford Hope, put it, entirely a party measure, pushed forward as a desperate attempt to unite the Liberal Party and not with a view to the benefit of the country. Now, a lot more could be said about the battles that raged in Parliament between 1870 and 1872 over Gladstone's uh, secret ballot bills, battles which were not simply about the merits of public and secret voting per se, but also about the motives behind Gladstone's adoption of the measure and the tactics he then used to force the bill through the Commons. A lot more could also be said about the extraordinary showdown, uh, what the Times called a violent collision, that occurred between the Commons and the Lords over secret voting, as uh, depicted in this cartoon. 
creating a standoff between the two houses, which lasted almost 18 months and had a number of important constitutional consequences. Instead, though, what I'd really like to highlight in my final comments here is the impact that the secret ballot had on the behaviour in those voting behaviour in those double member constituencies where voters had two votes at their disposal. Now, double member seats, it needs to be remembered, electors could either select two candidates from the same party, casting a straight party vote, or they could split their two votes between candidates from different parties in a form of non-party or, or cross-party vote. Alternatively, they could withhold one of their votes and select just one candidate, casting what was termed a plumper. One of the most common forms or popular forms of behaviour associated with public voting was the non-party or cross-party vote. Explaining to a parliamentary inquiry why he had always split his two votes, Richard Harris, a <coughs> topless blacksmith, observed that it was in order to please both parties, adding, I work for both sides. <laughs> I give one vote for principle and the other for interest, noted <laughs> one Blackburn elector. As a Conservative election agent, uh, explained to a, another 1852 inquiry. There are a great many respectable tradesmen who usually vote uh, not with regard to any politics, but from a desire to serve families and friends in the town who deal with them. And there are many respectable voters who always, at a general election, almost invariably divide their votes so as to offend neither party. So whether motivated by a need to represent other people, including non-electors, or a desire not to offend, Cross-party voting was clearly a popular form of behaviour in the age of public polling. And how then, did, we must be asked, did the move to secret voting affect these forms of electoral behaviour? If publicity was one of the driving forces behind one and one voting, pleasing both sides, did it decline after the introduction of the secret ballot? And how would the move to a written rather than an oral method of polling affect the voters' ability to navigate all the complex voting permutations usually 10 combinations at least, on offer in multiple member seats. Now, it might be thought that the introduction of secret voting would prevent us knowing the answers to these questions. Voting became secret. The detailed breakdowns of the way people voted in multiple member constituencies, that's the precise numbers of plumpers and double votes cast by individual electors that make up those final tallies, they continue to be made available after 1872 reflecting, I think, their importance to party managers and politicians. And of course, the very first parliamentary elections to use the secret ballot, which attracted huge publicity at the time, and of course, commanded the bulk of historical attention, were not multi-member elections, but by-elections, such as the Pontefract by-election of 1872, where the new system seemed to work relatively smoothly. Later on in 1872, however, issues began to emerge in the multi-member municipal elections, where two or more councillors were being elected. Reports of electors inadvertently crossing the wrong combinations of boxes, because the official ballot papers listed the candidates differently to the polling leaflets they had received, or of electors being confused about how many crosses they could use, or even writing their names on the paper, as they had done previously in municipal elections. These filled the local newspapers. Illiterate voters appear to have had a particularly difficult time. Great fun in a typically cruel Victorian fashion was made out of one gaily attired female voter at Sheffield's 1872 council elections, who after stating loudly that she could not read, had to be physically stopped from shouting out her choices by the returning officer. She was promptly taken aside, made to whisper her choices, one of whom actually wasn't standing, and then given a lecture about learning to read. <laughs> the biggest problem, however, which was to become an extremely significant issue in the 1874 general election, was the question of how to cast a good old-fashioned plumper. Shortly before the 1874 election, the Reading Mercury published this extraordinary, but by no means uncommon, advice. If the voter intends to vote, all he has to do is put a cross against the names of the candidates. Of course, if the voter intends to give up plumper, two crosses must be written opposite the name of the candidate thus favoured. Reports soon filled the press of voters up and down the country either intending to or actually casting multiple votes for one candidate, all of which, as agents and their candidates frantically tried to point out, invalidated their ballot papers. Many newspapers 
especially the London-based journals, blamed the confusion about plumping on the community voting introduced alongside the secret ballot for London's school board elections in 1870. Under this system, voters could and often did cast multiple votes for a single candidate. The Standard reported that because of the popular conflation of secret voting with cumulative voting, a widespread and serious misapprehension exists as to the mode of voting, especially among working men whose votes will be entirely thrown away. The plumping problem, however, was not just confined to London. In Brighton, one horrified Conservative candidate reported receiving multiple letters of support from voters saying, I shall give my two votes for you. Fearing the worst, on the eve of the poll, he issued a special address, warning that if my voters shall commit that error, hundreds, if not thousands, of votes will be lost. In East Sussex, it was noted that a very common error prevails, even among people who would not care to be thought ignorant, that they may give two votes to any one candidate. This is a great mistake. In Sunderland, one draper, questioned by a candidate, said he meant to give him his two votes. And things got so bad in Glasgow, which, like London, was subject to the additional confusion of the minority clause, that special notices had to be issued telling electors that you cannot give more than one vote to any one candidate or mark more than one X after the name of such candidate. Now, plumping was just one of the traditional forms of voting in multiple member seats that clearly did not translate smoothly onto a modern ballot paper. Many voters also struggle with selecting the correct combinations of candidates, just as they had done in the first secret municipal elections. And aided by the efforts of local parties and adverts in the parties and press, like these here, a deluge of information and advice about how best to support either the local Conservative Party or the Liberals quickly became available in most constituencies. But where did this leave the non-party voters, the backbone of the old public voting system, whose votes, it must be remembered, accounted for one-fifth of all those cast between 1832 and 1868. The analysis I've done so far indicates that cross-party voting and non-party plumping uh, both declined significantly in the 1874 and 1880 elections, for the first time dropping below 8%. The move to secrecy, it seems, not only removed some of the incentives that lay behind supporting both parties, but also the ballot paper itself seems to have made the whole business of casting non-party votes more complex and liable to confusion, requiring a greater political awareness and level of knowledge. And perhaps not surprisingly, I've yet to find any newspapers or polling leaflets offering advice to voters about how to cast one-on-one -on -one votes using the secret ballot. So time to very quickly uh, sum up. Uh, first, what's clear from our research on the 1832-68 project, and you can follow uh, more of that uh, on these various websites, is that the Victorian public voting system was far more uh, participatory than is often portrayed. Yes, people could be pressurised and intimidated unfairly to vote a certain way. But the upside, which we hear a lot less about, is that public voting allowed all those without a vote to see and influence how voters behaved as part of a very vibrant political culture that often engaged entire communities. And secondly, public voting remained hugely popular with a broad range of leading politicians, even many radicals, for decades after 1832. It was only brought to an end because of high politics and manoeuvres at the ministerial level, rather than any successful outdoors democratic campaign or popular reform movement putting irresistible pressure on Parliament. And thirdly, many of the traditional forms of voting behaviour associated with public polls, including various forms of non-partisanship, did not translate smoothly onto the ballot paper in England's multiple member seats. Plumping and splitting, in particular, became far more problematic and confusing for voters left to their own devices in the solitary secrecy of the polling booth. And it would not be long, of course, before this entire system of multiple votes and being able to make non-party choices would be almost completely abolished, making the use of the secret ballot much more straightforward. After just one more general election and yet another dramatic expansion of this franchise, most of the UK shifted to winner-takes-all single-member seats, a system that, for better or worse, of course continues to define our modern party politics today. Thank you.
fascinating and perfect timekeeping. Um, Marcia knows. Thank you. Uh, So, uh, before 1872, as we've just heard, uh, voting at parliamentary elections in the UK was a public act. Um, if you were fortunate enough to be enfranchised, your vote at the polling booth was public knowledge. It was available for your neighbours, landlords and employers to view in perpetuity, often via easily available poll books. Demands for secret voting, or the ballot as it was referred to by contemporaries, that parliamentary elections had been made by British radical politicians since the late 18th century. While their theories varied, uh, most reasons the ballot would shift the balance of power in the electoral system and thus British politics from the corrupt aristocracy to the people by ending voter intimidation and electoral bribery and reducing exorbitant election costs. After 1832, the ballot became a central demand of radicals and reformers inside and outside of Parliament. It was one of the major issues of the 1832, 1835 and 1837 elections and probably reached its popular zenith following the 1837 election, fading as a popular single issue during the 1840s when it was also one of the six points of the Charter, it was revived as a single issue campaign in the 1850s. However, as Bruce Kinzer, uh, the ballot historian, has noted, by the 1860s, the campaign appeared to have succumbed to the forces of neglect and indifference, um, as well as the general acceptance that voting should remain a public rather than a private act. <coughs> Today, I'm going to talk about the activities of three parliamentary figureheads of the ballot campaign between the first two reform acts. First, the power couple of 1830s British philosophic radicalism, George and Harriet Grote, and second, the eccentric MP, for Bristol and champion of the ballot from the late 1840s, Francis Henry Barty. The public face of the ballot campaign during the 1830s was George Grote. But out of public view, George was supported by his arguably more interesting, ambitious, and powerful wife, Harriet. George was an active partner in the family bank in the city of London, and Harriet grew up in Southampton, the daughter of a wealthy East India merchant. They married in 1820, and over the following decade emerged as leading figures among a set of metropolitan progressive thinkers called the Philosophic Radicals. Among this group were the leading utilitarians, Jeremy Bentham and James Mill, and during the 1820s, the groups hosted both men and their extended coterie every Wednesday and Saturday at the dreary hour of 8.30 a.m., and broke their fast upon the latest emanation of the James Mill brain. Um, at the first election after the 1832 Reform Act, George was the group's chosen candidate for the City of London. With over 18,000 voters, it was the UK's largest constituency. George was returned at the top of the poll with over 8,000 votes. His status as the senior member for the capital of the empire, as Harriet put it, instantly placed him at the centre of Westminster's parliamentary radicals. Ahead of the opening of the first reform parliament, George was nominated by his fellow radical MPs to lead the parliamentary campaign for the ballot. By 1833, both Harriet and George saw the ballot as the key factor in forcing a fundamental political realignment in British politics from the sinister interest of the aristocracy to the universal interest of the people. On introducing his first ballot motion in 1833, George celebrated secret voting as the best means of protecting freedom of voting from the mere forces of natural causes, which he listed as the influence of landlords over tenants, employers over laborers, and customers over tradesmen, and the illegitimate influence of the rich man to extort those votes which he had not virtue enough to earn. George's strictly argumentative speeches on the topic usually lasted between one and three hours. <laughs> While George was leading the 1833 debate, his wife Harriet was watching from the ventilator above the commons, or as she called it, the lantern, which allowed for 10 or 12 persons to be so placed as to hear, and to a certain extent see, what passed in the house. On the night of George's first ballot motion, Harriet held court in the ventilator before hosting one of her increasingly famous soirees at their rented residence. 
Parliament Street. While Parliament was in session during 1833, Harriet became Westminster's premier radical hostess, holding nightly salons and open houses across the road from Parliament. MPs locked in with all the news as politicians, thinkers, journalists, and lawyers, and their wives, sisters, and mothers discussed the day's events. On the weekends, the groups cultivated in a circle at their country residence in Dulwich. Henry Warburton and Joseph Hume, senior radical dignitaries such as Francis Place, rising new MPs such as Joan Hart Roebuck, Charles Buller, and William Molesworth, the editor of The Spectator, Robert Rintoul, the writer Sarah Austin, and the young utilitarian John Stuart Mill. For those present, it was clear who was in charge. In contrast to her reclusive husband, Harriet was outgoing, charming, and sociable. One contemporary remarked, I like him, he is so ladylike, and I like her, she's such a perfect gentleman. <coughs> Over the next seven years, Harriet plotted and schemed London's leading radicals, doing her best to organize what was a ragtag bunch who lacked an effective male parliamentary leader. And by January 1837, we find Harriet overseeing a 12-month period of political campaigning that placed the ballot at the centre of British radical politics. By 1837, Harriet and George had realised the need to galvanise radical forces by turning talk and theory about the ballot into a realistic prospect. While MPs had debated and voted on the ballot in 1833, 35, and 36, the practical detail of secret voting was still unclear. If Parliament approved the ballot, what would a ballot act look like, and how would secret voting work in practice? Harriet took to solving both issues ahead of a planned parliamentary debate in 1837. The first issue was the creation of draft legislation. To do this, she enlisted her friend, the barrister and reformer Sutton Sharp, and he mocked up a draft ballot bill with Harriet, which she published in The Spectator. The response to the bill was mixed, however. Harriet wrote to Sharp saying, I am almost as fagged as George himself, with helping him in his many tasks. I have sundry letters to reply to from new correspondents who have let fly at him since the apparition of the ballot bill in the in last Sunday Spectator. One of the key discussion points was what would a ballot box look like and how would it work? The easy option was a box that voters slipped voting cards into, similar to that in use in the UK today. For Harriet, though, and many others, including the ballot's opponents, a simple box left too much room for fraud from election officials and voters. Harriet advocated a more complex machine that required voters to punch holes in preloaded cards and that allowed for illiterate and blind voters to vote with the verbal support of an election officer in a different room. Um, so it would be the ballot box would be there, and the room that uh, the official would be on the other side. Um, and a week after the publication of their ballot bill, Harriet revealed their plans for a ballot box in The Spectator, um, which she and George had developed with a Hartford carpenter, William Thomas. Now, once a physical model was built, Harriet then sought endorsements from high-profile public figures. And while with their models and bill in hand, parliamentary support for the ballot increased to 160 MPs in February 1837. The Groats campaign was then given further impetus by the 1837 general election. Um, the results were dispiriting for radicals and reformers as conservative candidates won over 300 common seats. Harriet and many radicals across the country blamed the rise in conservative fortunes on venality and corruption in the old boroughs and intimidation in the counties. These were symptoms that Harriet and George were sure the ballot would cure. To ensure that MPs continued to feel pressure on the ballot, Harriet and George distributed around 40 ballot boxes to leading radicals and reformers across the country by November 1837. Their hope was that boxes would be displayed at public meetings that would then petition Parliament. Demand for the model ballot boxes quickly caught on. Harriet wrote to her ally, the veteran radical Francis Place, asking, could you let me have the ballot box again now you have shown it to most of your people? I really can't get them back from country towns fast enough to circulate and are hard up for one to go to Worcester by special request from the radical mayor of that town, Mr. George Allies, and his co rats Requests for ballot boxes and levels of incoming correspondence were so high by December 1837 that the Groats followed the advice of a young Richard Cobden and set up a London ballot union. The union sought to replicate the strategies of the parliamentary reform and anti-slavery movements of the early 1830s. And Harriet wasn't the only woman working on the campaign either. 
In December 1837, she wrote to Mary Gaskell, the wife of the former MP for Wakefield, Daniel Gaskell. She wrote, if you will return Mr. Oldham's model, as he seems ravenous for it, you can have one for yourself now by writing to the secretary to our new ballot union. We have had shoals of letters expressing <coughs> delight with an approbation of the contrivance, and many who wished for secrecy yet mistrusted its being attained have become hearty balloteers since the box was exhibited to them. <coughs> the campaigning worked, and Parliament received 365 petitions signed by over 180,000 persons during the 1837-38 session. Uh, despite a decline in the number of radical and reformer MPs since the 1837 election, the number of MPs willing to support Grove's ballot motion in 1838 increased to 203. Constituency pressure on non-conservative MPs then became so much that by the following year, the Wigan Melbourne government was forced to declare the ballot an open issue. This meant that when Grote held his annual vote in June 1839, 221 MPs supported his motion. Um, that's with pairs included. 18 of, um, of these MPs were either in the Whig cabinet or in lesser government positions. So while on paper the 1839 vote appears a high point in the ballot campaign. In private, um, Harriet and George had actually accepted it as the end of the campaign. While the ballot had been popular in town meetings across the country in the winter of 1837, it was no match for the more visceral and emotive demands that were emerging in the People's Charter, which was uh, released um, in 1838, published in 1838, um, the Anti-Corn Law League, established in 1838, and the British and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society, established in 1839. All was not well among Parliament's radicals either, who had split over the rebellions in Canada um, and the government's proposed suspension of the Jamaican Constitution in 1839. George confessed in private to only introducing the 1839 ballot motion in order that members could satisfy their constituents. And Harriet was dismayed, dismayed at the flatness of debate about the ballot in 1839. In truth, both were tied with politics. They were tied with the new working class radicalism of the Chartists, the narrow mindedness of the middle classes and the shopkeeper 10 pound voters, the hopeless radical MPs, and the even worse Whig leadership. Never mind the rest of the aristocracy and the looming prospect of a Conservative government. Um, and also, George was at risk of uh, losing his seat in London because he supported the poor laws. Um, they retired from Parliament at the 1841 election. So, in the final part of the paper, I'm just going to go on to Francis Henry Barclay. Um, so, with the bro brokes gone, the ballots enjoyed something of a fallow period, really, until 1848 in Parliament, when it was taken up by the eccentric Liberal MP for Bristol, Francis Henry Fitzharding Barclay, or Henry Barclay, as he was known, or Ballot Barclay, as he was eventually nicknamed. Um, he was the illegitimate son of the gambler and libertine, the fifth Earl of Barclay, and in his teenage years, he was an eager amateur boxer. He dropped out of Oxford, and unlike the Grote, spent most of the 1820s traveling around Europe. He joined his equally fast-living brothers in Parliament in 1837 as MP for Bristol, and continued to represent the constituency as a liberal until his death in 1870. Barclay's claim to fame at Westminster was his annual ballot motion, which he introduced every year between 1848 and 1866. Uh, these motions passed on three occasions, three occasions in thin houses, um, and they were usually held towards the end of a parliamentary <coughs> session, um, and they attracted varying numbers of MPs, but by the 1860s were considered more parliamentary entertainment than serious attempts at legislation. That anyone still went to them was probably due to Barclay's reputation for making entertaining speeches. That said, at least one motion for Parliament would normally attract around 400 MPs to the division lobbies. Uh, with pairs included, Barclay's 1858 motion saw 550, 540 MPs reported their opinion, um, 380 opposed, 220 supported. And this was 20 fewer MPs than the 560 that voted or paired over Grove's 1839 motion. Barclay's speeches themselves, rather than the urgency of debate, became the biggest draw. To distance himself from the Whig Liberal Prime Ministers Russell and Palmerston, who opposed the ballot, Barclay made his speeches from the opposition front benches with his collection of notebooks full of instances of electoral co corruption scattered in front of him on the table. He rarely offered new arguments and always acknowledged and often quoted directly from Grote's past speeches. 
He did bring in some contemporary examples of success of the ballot, um, lauding its implementation in American states, Switzerland, Holland, Belgium, France, Australia, as well as in a number of British institutions and political clubs. Importantly, his speeches were littered with anecdotes of corrupt practices at elections. Um, there were references to golden reservoirs and bowls full of sovereigns at Great Yarmouth, the ladies of rank and lofty dames intimidating voters in their houses at Westminster, the landlords coercing their tenants, the 49 peers that control 62 small boroughs. There were scenes of slaughter and intimidation and men dying in states quite unconscious with gaping wounds on fractured schools at Cork. There were also three Roman Catholic priests getting beaten up by a crowd of women at New Ross and voters being kept in pens like sheep at Devonport. Outside of Parliament, Barclay uh, tried to maintain momentum for the campaign as chairman of the Ballot Society, uh, which he formed on the advice of Richard Com Copland in 1853. The Society aimed to replicate the success of the anti corn Law League by striking another stake in the heart of the aristocratic dominance. Both reasoned that without external pressure, Parliament would never act on the ballot. The Society, however, was beset by problems uh, and never really achieved the popularity it needed. As Bruce Kinzer has discussed, there were problems with jealousy among reformers, disagreements to whether the ballot should be considered a single issue policy, and increasing indifference to the issue by the late 1850s. Uh, Joseph Hume advised Berkeley, Berkeley sorry, that the ballot on its own could never generate mass support, while suffrage should remain limited. He feared, perhaps rightly, that the working class and enfranchised would see the ballot as an attempt by a middle class elite to ensure secrecy in the voting process and exclude non-electors from participating in influencing elections. By the mid-1850s as well, previous supporters like John Stuart Mill were arguing that open voting was the best means of ensuring the morality of voters to act in the public good. And even George Grote uh, ultimately came round to a similar view. Harriet Grote's stance by the 1860s remains unclear. And also by the 1860s, uh, the ballot well, seemed a little old-fashioned in comparison to new liberal movements associated with temperance, and militant dissenters or secularists calling for disestablishment or um, education reform. Barclay, um, and we'll leave with this, was also a problem. Um, by the 1860s, his health was faltering. Um, his speeches seemed to be tired or lacking in humor, and they attracted thin numbers in the house. There were even rumors he no longer actually supported the ballot. Um, in 1863, the usually neutral Illustrated London News opined the ballot without jokes has no meaning for members, and in 1865, the Conservative Punch happily mocked the farce called the ballot motion. By 1865, even the Ballot Society concluded that the Ballot Society that Barclay was the chairman of concluded um, that Barclay's annual motions um, had, had been detrimental to the cause. Um, his jokes had actually turned the ballot into a joke. Um, they, they asked him to stop introducing his annual motions. He refused, resigned from the society, and introduced his final motion in 1866. <coughs> Um, this marked the end of the Ballot Society as an active organization, and when the Liberal leadership failed to back up the secret voting during the 1866 and 67 8 reform debates, all hope to be at lost. Um, there was little indication that secret voting in parliamentary elections was just around the corner. Thank you. 
So I'm going to use the first parliamentary by-election of the Ballot Act held at Pontefract as a lens to explore some of the wider issues surrounding the reform of election procedure and its impact on electoral culture. Astonishingly, the very first contest using the ballot took place just five days after the Ballot Act received the royal assent. The measure also applied to municipal elections, as we heard from Philip, and the ballot's first use was at a municipal by-election at Boston in Lincolnshire. Given the haste with which local officials had to make arrangements, it's hardly surprising that there were some errors in procedure which the local MP raised in the Commons a few days later. It was reported that the Boston ballot box had been open rather than locked and sealed, and it was also claimed that some voters had been asked how they would vote and had their ballot papers filled in for them. By the time the first parliamentary contest was held at Pontefract on the 15th of August, almost a month after the Act passing, there had been a little more time to prepare, although, as we'll see, some arrangements were still rather makeshift. Now, this contest was a ministerial by-election prompted by the appointment of one of Pontefract's MPs, the Liberal Hugh Childers, to Gladstone's government. Although he faced a Conservative opponent, um, there was a little doubt of his victory, and had it not been for the novelty of seeing the ballot in operation, this by-election would have attracted little interest. Rather curiously, Childers, who had been defeated by Count Pollington by a majority of 80 votes, had been elected once before by the secret ballot. He served as a member of the Legislative Assembly in Victoria, Australia, which had adopted it in 1856. His maiden speech in the Westminster Parliament in 1860 had been on the operation of the ballot in Australia, which he felt had been thoroughly successful. The 1872 Pontefract contest was watched with considerable curiosity across Britain, as one press report put it. It was widely reported in the press, and election agents from different parts of the country flocked to Pontefract to see the new electoral machinery in action. The secret ballot's first trial in parliamentary elections generally felt to have been a success. There were very few spoilt or rejected papers. Despite the delay in transporting the ballot boxes from one outlying district, Pontefract's mayor, who was the returning officer, was able to count the votes and announce the result just four hours after the poll closed. Um, the Times did, however, grumble that this was rather slow, and it questioned how the new system would work in large metropolitan constituencies such as Hackney, where there were over 40,000 40, voters, which was more than 20 times as many as Pontefract. It's very odd that the Times chose Hackney as its example, because at the 1874 general election, this was actually an isolated example of a constituency where things went wrong. The printer who was supposed to supply the ballot papers and ballot boxes and so on um, failed to deliver at the time. Two polling stations were unable to open at all, affecting over 4,800 voters, and four others opened an hour late with voters waiting outside ready to vote. And this election was declared void on petition. The short interval between three and six days between the nomination and the poll meant that returning officers usually had to rely on local suppliers for the last minute task of printing the ballot papers because they wouldn't be sure until the nomination exactly who could stand. But for other items, they could turn to one of the larger firms which specialised in election supplies. One of the best known was Knight & Co of Fleet Street. And here's that advertisement. This is taken from the 1877 edition of the local government directory. As you can see, they can provide everything from indelible pencils to mark the ballot paper to the perpetual self inking ballot stamp. And they offer metal ballot boxes at 15 shillings or a guinea, depending on the size required. Now, interestingly, the Ballot Act didn't provide exact specifications about the format of the ballot box, just that it shouldn't be possible to extract ballot papers without unlocking it, and that it should be locked and sealed by the presiding officer. Um, so this is one of the surviving, this is the surviving ballot box from Pontefract in 1872, and as you'll see, this is a wooden box, and it was sealed with a stamp used in a local factory to stamp out Pontefract cakes, which are a kind of licorice sweet, if you're not familiar with those. So even as voting procedures were becoming more formalized and standardized, some local products remained. On the other hand, the sourcing of election requisites from outside the constituency, whether it was returning officers getting their ballot stamps, or local activists turning to party headquarters for election leaflets and posters was something which was becoming increasingly significant in this period, especially after the curbs on election spending imposed by the 1883 Corrupt Practices Act. The first experiences of the Ballot Act at Pontefract didn't go entirely smoothly, however. There were reports of bewildered voters being coached by party activists on how to mark their papers. Three elderly voters forgot their spectacles and they had to be assisted using the procedure for blind voters. 
one voter, um, rather like the woman um, Philip mentioned earlier, resisted the new method by shouting Hollington at the top of his voice, declaring he was not ashamed of his vote, he did not mind who knew how he voted. And there were similar examples of resistance to the ballot in this way at the 1874 general election. And there were also some rather haphazard arrangements at Pontefract. At one polling station, the compartments were very badly constructed, and so they left gaps in between, between um, voters could actually peer into the adjoining compartments. Um, polling stations were supposed to have a separate entrance and exit, and one schoolroom, which had hastily been adapted for, for voting, had voters coming in through the door, but they had to go out through the window, which had been removed, <laughs> down some rather wobbly boards into the playground below, and the press had a field day sort of commenting on it. The boats are doing their solemn duty and then wobbling down these boards, bouncing, <laughs> bouncing down like a gymnast. Um, and that potentially more significant issue than this was the high proportion of illiterate voters. 199 out of the 1,236 who polled about 16 percent. This slowed down proceedings because for each of these electors a special declaration had to be made and the room had to be cleared of any other voters before they could give their vote orally and have their ballot paper marked by the election officials. A Pontefract mayor suggested that um, because of the rural population in some parts of the constituencies, Pontefract had a greater number than average of illiterates. And he suggested ways that the procedure could be sped up, particularly for the benefit of larger constituencies. At the 1880 election, just under 30,000 voters polled as illiterates in England and Wales, which is around 1.4% of those who voted. The figure was higher in Ireland at 2.3%. After the Third Reform Act extended the franchise, the figures remained relatively low in England, Scotland and Wales, averaging 2.3%. But this wasn't evenly distributed. So, uh, um, if you take Norfolk, in North Norfolk, one in seven voters declared themselves as illiterate, which was ten times the level that in the county town of Norwich. And in Ireland, a staggering 22% of voters polled this way in 1885. Returning to Pontefract in 1872, the general impression of the new system was positive. Childers was among those who rejoiced that the secret ballot had proved thoroughly workable. There were no allegations of bribery or other corrupt practices having taken place, and the unruly behaviour which had often marred elections was absent. Seasoned observers declared they never saw a contested election in which less intoxicating liquor was drunk. The town was so quiet and orderly that local tradespeople said it hardly seemed like an election. Hmm. One factor which helped to combat some of the traditional disorder of elections was that it became more difficult for the rival parties to make announcements of the state of the poll during polling day. With open voting, it was relatively straightforward to work out which party was ahead, and updates were published while the polling was in progress. On an hourly basis in some constituencies, this could fuel a great deal of excitement, which sometimes spilled over into violence. It also encouraged bribery as parties sought to maximise their chances of victory, particularly when results were close. So some voters would deliberately hold out from polling until later in the day in the hope of being paid more for their vote. As well as the effects of the ballot, the changed atmosphere of the electoral contest owed a great deal to another key reform introduced as part of the Ballot Act, and that is the abolition of public nominations. The Hustings, and here you can see um, the nomination at Time Out and North Shields in 1861, had drawn large crowds, as Philip's already mentioned, women, children, and other non electors could all attend. And to take just one example of the numbers attending, at Rochdale in 1857, 10,000 people were said to have attended the Hustings. This was almost a third of the town's population and a far greater number than the 1,200 registered voters. At Pontefract in 1872, in contrast, the candidates handed in their nomination papers privately and unceremoniously at the town hall. Unlike the festive atmosphere of previous nominations, hardly anyone left his work or business. Now, this aspect of the ballot act has received far less attention than the debates about the principle and practicalities of using the secret ballot. But the abolition of public nominations marked a major shift in electoral culture. Although the introduction of the ballot was the government's key aim when it brought forward its first bill on the subject in 1870, this measure also included three proposals on other aspects of the electoral process. Alongside the abolition of public nominations, it stipulated that public houses should not be hired as committee rooms, a change intended to curb the drunkenness and treating often associated with elections. If some members of the 1869 Select Committee on Elections which received the introduction of the bill had had their way, this would have gone further and also banned the holding of election meetings in pubs. But this was rejected on the casting vote of the committee chairman, Lord Hartington. 
The 1870 Bill also proposed that any payment not included in the return of election expenditure submitted by candidates should be deemed to be a corrupt payment. And this provision reflected the growing sense that the cost of elections was spiralling out of control and that candidates' free spending in order to win a seat, even where this didn't involve bribery or treating, was in itself a form of corruption. It also aimed to give candidates an opportunity to resist excessive demands from their constituents, a theme which came to loom large in later debates on corrupt practices legislation. Alongside these reforms, the 1871 version of the bill included another clause relating to the wider culture of elections, the proposal that the official expenses of elections incurred by returning officers for the ballot papers and the polling booths and so on should no longer be paid by the candidates but should instead be funded from the rates. The Liberal backbencher Henry Fawcett was the most prominent advocate of this reform, but he was to be disappointed when the Commons rejected it in 1871. Now, debates on electoral and corrupt practice legislation tended to be particularly time consuming because this was an issue where virtually all MPs could bring their experiences of electioneering to bear, and which had potentially significant consequences for them, so they liked to have their say. The ballot bills were no exception, and in 1872, the government decided that if it was going to get the ballot through, it needed to drop any extraneous clauses. So they dropped the clauses on corrupt payments and on public houses, and bowed to the House's verdicts against um, the payment of official expenses from the rates, but they retained the abolition of public nominations. Uh, I think this was passed into law, although not without what the Times described as sentimental pangs being expressed by members on both sides at parting with this ancient ritual. Disraeli was among those who consistently voted for the retention of the hustings, while from the Liberal benches, Edward Boudry argued that if the House accepted this clause, a nomination would become so like a funeral that they might as well have the parish church bell told during the proceedings. <laughs> Although witnesses to the 1869 Select Committee on Elections were generally critical of public nominations, the report, the committee's report, hadn't recommended abolition. Its members were divided on this question and hadn't come up with a suitable alternative to the hustings. But it was included as a key element of the government's ballot bill in 1870. Hartington put the case that too often a public nomination is nothing but an expensive and mischievous and useless farce, which tends to bring the constitution of this country and representatives and institutions generally into contempt, and which tends also to disgust the most peaceable and intelligent portion of the constituency with everything connected with elections. The disorder, sometimes descending into violence, and the vast amount of idleness, drunkenness, and ill feeling associated with the nomination were key arguments for the abolition of what Marcus and Griffin pithily described as a gala of all the rucks and blackguards in a town. In a leader published while the 1868 election was still in progress, the Times suggested that public nominations might in future be abolished. Since the crowds who attended did not listen to and often couldn't hear the speeches, it was a useless procedure which was only continued in deference to memorial, immemorial tradition. But the defenders of the hustings emphasised their value and the importance of publicity. The future Liberal Minister, William Harcourt, said he had no wish to see elections become like a papal conclave, and he argued that public men were accustomed to the rough air of the hustings in this country. The constituencies liked to see the horses trotted out and witness the preliminary counter of the race and form an opinion of the horses themselves. From the Conservative benches, Joshua Fielden described the nomination as simply the most important public meeting in this country. He was critical of any attempt to replace it with a hole and corner meeting, declaring that there was something noble and manly in a man who sought the suffrage of his brother Alexis doing so openly. On the other hand, the idea that anyone went to the hostages to hear the candidates' opinions was ridiculed by those who advocated abolition. As John Bright argued, what are called the speeches and nominations are not speeches at all, but attempts to scream out a few words or sentences in the ear of a friendly reporter. In most constituencies, candidates had already made their views known to the electors through their election addresses and at election meetings. Although John Lawrence has noted that in some constituencies in the what he talked terms the more feudal parts of rural Scotland, the nomination might be the only occasion on which locally influential candidates felt that they actually ought to turn up and speak. But even before the 1868 election, there were calls to abolish the hustings. During the debates on the second reform, John Bright had expressed his hopes that the time would come when the Commons abolished them as a relic of a barbarous time, wholly unfitted for the common sense or civilization of the present day. And in researching for this paper, I actually found out that several town councils petitioned against them, 
So the first one was Coventry in April 1868. The um, town council petitioned for abolition on the grounds that bringing together masses of people with opposite political views frequently leads to breaches of the peace and was a serious and unnecessary interruption of ordinary business, added greatly to the cost of elections. And Coventry's town clerk was actually instructed to encourage other councils to petition in the similar vein. Now, whether or not this was in response to Coventry's uh, correspondence, five other towns, Liverpool, Brighton, Devonport, Scarborough, and Blackburn, petitioned Parliament ahead of the 1868 general election for the abolition of the hustings. Coventry, Liverpool, and Blackburn petitioned again in 1869, as did at least 20 other towns, you can see on the map here. And while these petitions came largely from the uh, industrial north and Midlands, this wasn't exclusively the case. Dumfries, Scarborough, and Ipswich were among the boroughs which sent petitions. More significantly, most of these petitions came from town councils. Uh, there was one from uh, the Taunton Workingmen's Liberal Association, but it was these local authorities, together with local magistrates, which had to seek to prevent and curtail any uh, outbreaks of election disorder and dealing with the aftermath. These petitions, previously overlooked by historians, are indicative of a growing desire for changes in electoral culture. And their timing is significant, coinciding as it did with the extension of the borough franchise. When their petition was being discussed by Coventry's council in April 1868, one alderman stated that he wouldn't have supported it before because it removed the opportunity for non-electors to participate by holding up their hands at the nomination. And the impact of the second reform that was also referred to in discussions on other boroughs, from other boroughs of the petition, um, including Hull and Manchester. But the parliamentary defenders of the open hostings took a different view. For Joshua Field, it was important that even the poorest could attend the nomination and that the people could see their candidate in the light of day, put questions to him, and hold up their hands on the question of whether he was fit to represent them. From the opposite side of the House, Edward Boothbury argued that nominations provided an education in politics for non-electors who should not be deprived of their right to participate. While William Harcourt pointed out that non-voters still significantly outnumber those with the franchise, and his figures were referring to adult males, but obviously you take women and children as well, they'd be more significant. But it was the arguments for abolition which proved more persuasive to the comment, although the not insignificant number of 177 MPs voted in the minority to retain the last things on one occasion. Although the candidate's speeches may not always be audible or listened to, the argument that the nomination was an important opportunity for non-electors to participate in political proceedings was nonetheless a valid one. In line with James Vernon's arguments about the closing down of the public political sphere, the ballot act shouldn't be assumed to be straightforward and democratic. Some curbed rather than enabled their participation in politics. If the parliamentary debates on the ballot in the experience of Pontefract in 1872 suggested that the elections in the future would be rather unexciting affairs and free from corruption, this was a mistaken impression. Candidates may no longer have greeted lively hustings audiences, but the election meetings became increasingly important as an opportunity for the public to see their would-be representatives face to face and to test their manliness through their ability to face down heckling and disruption, as the work of John Lawrence in particular has shown. The nomination day might not be the general holiday it once was, but elections in many constituencies continue to be colourful events with a great deal of drunkenness and rowdy behaviour. Participation by non-electors remain possible, notably through being employed in various roles as election workers. Although the ballot certainly helped to reduce the intimidation of voters, the election agents who came to observe the Pontypract suggested that bribery would still be perfectly possible in the future. And the election petitions and investigations by royal commissions confirm the continued existence of electoral corruption after 1872. Here you can see the number of um, election petitions with some seated between 1832 and 1900. 1868 had produced uh, an unprecedentedly high number of petitions. You see the rising trend in the mid-century because of a switch to judicial trial of petitions. But then the numbers didn't really fall back in 1874 or 1880 following the torrent of gin and beer in Gladstone's famous words, which saw the Liberals lose the 1874 election, the 1880 contest served only to heighten concerns about escalating election expenditure, particularly with another member of measure of franchise extension <coughs> anticipated. Having sought to tackle the issue of intimidation with the 1872 Ballot Act, Liberal ministers with considerable cross-party support took action on questions of bribery and excessive expenditure a decade later, resulting in the 1883 Corrupt Practices Act, a measure which transformed electoral culture just as much as the ballot. 
important. Okay, we are ready to begin the second panel of today's symposium, which will be putting electoral reform into comparative perspective. And first up, we have Tom Brook and Malcolm Brook, who have together published um, a range of comparative histories of the secret ballot. Um, Tom is currently a historian of modern Britain at Oxford Brooks. And Malcolm recently published on the general history of France called How the French Learned to Vote and is now retired from the University. So, as we were ready. Thank you very much. And indeed, um, first of all, many thanks for this invitation to participate in this symposium on the 150th anniversary of the Secret Ballot Act in Britain and its wider ramifications. The secret ballot, of course, is just one aspect, albeit a totemic one, of the processes that create greater electoral integrity, so that an expanding mass franchise become more genuinely inclusive. So today, rather than uh, revisit our earlier publications on that particular subject, we would like to develop our comparative, uh, collaborative work on voting by exploring what might be called rituals of electoral verification, rituals, that is to say, uh, concerned in one way or another with establishing the integrity of the individual elector. And we shall do this by placing these practices in the context of the long-term history of the UK, France, and the US. And as some of you might have guessed, our interest in this subject has been prompted by recent legislation mandating the presentation of some form of visual ID at British elections. Now, we will be scandalously brief about all of this. We're going to restrict ourselves to just four key points and offer what's really just a whistle-stop tool of the historic uh, landscape. Okay, so I'm going to uh, start with our first uh, point, which is uh, simply that uh, prior to the introduction of the secret ballot in all three countries that we're considering, which uh, in the UK, of course, occurred in 1872, in uh, American states from the uh, late 1880s onwards, and France in 1913, we find resort to uh, two basic means of verification. On the one hand, there were rudimentary bureaucratic checks on a voter's identity, and thus uh, qualification to vote. Though in Britain, no registration uh, system was created for uh, voting until 1832. Before this, voters in parliamentary elections would have to provide their uh, name, uh, address, and occupation to the polling clerks, who would normally check them against some kind of uh, fiscal or property uh, record. It was more or less the same in colonial America, where practices for state elections uh, very much mirror those uh, in Britain. And the same was also broadly true of France, where in some localities, fiscal registers were used to uh, establish uh, identity from the uh, 1770s onwards. However, after the revolution of 1789, electoral lists were drawn up uh, in every location. And in some cases, uh, notably at uh, Paris, electoral cards or cartes d'électeur were also issued to uh, assist in the, in the process. So that was one sort of uh, veri verification of a very rudimentary sort. On the other hand, electors might be required to uh, swear one or more oaths, which were broadly of two types. Loyalty oaths and oaths attesting to their personal independence. Though American states, owing to their relative paucity of records, also commonly administer those verifying age and residence. In Britain, for example, electors might be asked to swear an oath of allegiance to the monarch, or one that effectively disavowed the doctrines of the Catholic Church. In America, they might do likewise, and or swear allegiance to the governor of a colony. While in revolutionary France, electors were required to affirm their loyalty to the uh, succession of different regimes that followed the upheaval of 1789. Similar variations emerged around the theme of electoral independence, 
in France, electors were required to enact an oath of impartiality. In Britain, that no bribe or gift had come their way. And in America, that as free men, they were not beholden to others. Now, a significant uh, caveat must be entered uh, here, namely that in those electoral contexts which involve very few electors, the closed boroughs of 18th century Britain, the parish assemblies of old regime France, and the small town settlements of New England, it seems there was no real resort to uh, bureaucratic checks or oath-taking of any sort. The explanation is uh, fairly straightforward. These were often non-competitive elections. They were more about uh, acclamation than, uh, than competition and uh, choice. And crucially, people knew one another. In other words, trust wasn't an issue. By contrast, in other electoral settings, general elections in Britain and in France after 1789, or state elections in colonial America, trust was in rather shorter supply. These contests were more fiercely fought, and uh, above all, they involved polling people who might not be known to either officials or candidates. Context was crucial, in other words, and in Britain, as in most American states, oaths were administered when requested, but uh, perhaps for only 10% of voters. So, uh, so what changed and why? This is our second point. Crudely put, oath-taking uh, declined while bureaucratic checks intensified. Questions of personal identity trumped those of loyalty and moral independence. The key driver of this was the growth of mass franchises, which amplified the problem of trust described above, whilst placing a premium on mechanisms that could A, expedite the process of voting, and B, secure greater integrity and order. It's significant that in England and Wales, loyalty owners were first removed by the same act which, in 1835, reduced polling in boroughs to one day, and that the bribery of was ended uh, by the UK-wide 1854 Corrupt Practices Act, which instituted, among other things, more precise auditing requirements. Meanwhile, in France, oaths were swept away en masse following the inception in 1848 of universal manhood suffrage, which resulted <coughs> in the electorate of nine million men and the replacement of electoral assemblies with more business-like polling stations. A similar trajectory was followed in the US, save for one significant detour <coughs> during the, uh, the Civil War of the early 1860s, when loyalty oaths to the Union were applied in the so-called border states of Delaware, <coughs> Kentucky, and Missouri. Now, it's tempting to think of the secret ballot as uh, completing this process, and it did to some extent. In all three countries, it was accompanied by regulations which restricted the questions that might be asked of voters to those concerned by name and address, while determining quite precisely how ballots should be cast, marked, counted, and stored. Indeed, the only oath that might be applied post secrecy was an oath of identity, but these, it seems, were never administered. Equally, the fact of secrecy helped to naturalize the idea that the voter should be able to enact his civic duty through of encumbrance or challenge. His identity having been quickly verified, everything else was for the anonymity of ballot box. Yet from the long-term perspective adopted here, the secret ballot, the basic principle of which has not been a challenge since its introduction, is better thought of as constituting but a single point of relative consistency around which other key elements and reforms, including those relating to the verification of a voter's identity, have remained in flux. And this uh, brings us to uh, our third point, involving reference to uh, two uh, vital, but uh, not especially sexy, and therefore uh, rather neglected uh, elements in this regard, electoral registration and the use of ID cards. 
in France, owing to the relative simplicity and uniformity of its franchise after 1848, registration was not an especially contentious issue, certainly not in comparison to the UK and the US. In France, uh, legislation required the annual publication of an electoral list compiled by the local administration, which was subsequently open to uh, general inspection and amendment. However, in the UK, the kind of wrangling that had occurred at the polling place itself was after 1832 decanted elsewhere into partisan struggles over the annual creation of electoral registers, something not really resolved until uh, 1918 with the uh, advent of a simpler franchise and uh, a system of uh, household registration. The US case is uh, somewhat different and rather more uh, notorious because after the withdrawal of federal supervision in 1877, southern states began imposing strict residency requirements as well as literacy tests ostensibly in the interest of ensuring that all voters could read the now increasingly used ballot papers. Kindred innovations subsequently appeared in the North to produce a bundle of intricate state-based regulations that lasted as late as 1975 when literary tests, literacy tests were finally prohibited. As we've already noted, uh, France was the first country to use electoral cards, with the early examples dating from the 1790s. They became mandatory in the 19th century as a means of proving a citizen's inscription on the electoral register. And though they're no longer obligatory today, most voters still present them as a means of helping electoral officials identify them on the list. In 1884, it was decreed that a cup d'électeur would be delivered to each elector, indicating where he should vote and recording his personal details. In 1932, a uniform design was adopted, and uh, voters were also reminded that voting is a right, but it is also a civic duty, as you can see on the card on the, the right-hand side there renamed the Cut Electoral in 1994 to uh, belatedly recognize the advent of a female franchise 50 years earlier. It is now formally presented to all young people in France when they reach the voting age of 18. In the UK, of course, we have something uh, similar, namely polling cards, which were first issued at the general election of 1950. While well, US states have at various times distributed cards of this sort as well. However, unlike France, their presentation at the polling station has never been compulsory. You can vote without uh, your, uh, your voter's card. The obligatory presentation of uh, ID cards uh, proper uh, was uh, another French innovation. After 1946, electors in all communes with over 5,000 inhabitants were required to present some kind of photographic ID prior to voting, a practice that persists to this day, albeit with the uh, community threshold reduced to 1,000 uh, inhabitants, a reminder of the uh, importance of context and trust in the uh, process of verification. The National Cut d'identité, which began to be issued to all French <coughs> citizens after 1945, was the most commonly presented document on a short list, which also included passports and driving licenses. This was an electoral innovation that reflected a peculiar French commitment to a bureaucratic rigor. Uh, however, both the UK and the US have recently begun to embrace ID cards. In the former, the uh, presentation of uh, a passport, benefits book, or marriage certificate was introduced into Northern Ireland in 1985. <coughs> this requirement was tightened up in 2002 when photographic ID 
became compulsory. It's essentially these uh, requirements, of course, that are in the process of being introduced into British elections as a result of the 2022 elections bill. In the US, the use of ID cards extends back only to the 1970s, when Florida, South Carolina, and Hawaii became uh, the first states to request their presentation. But since 2000, their use has uh, expanded significantly to the extent that some 35 states of the Union now have laws requiring uh, photographic ID, albeit with varying degrees of strictness. So this brings us to our fourth and uh, final concluding point, which is that all of these uh, developments are part of the history, <coughs> yes, of electoral reform and democratic enfranchisement, but also of electoral exclusion and manipulation. We should not entirely focus on the latter. Um, it's difficult to see how any mass elections could operate without registers or basic questioning polling officials. Equally, the demand for ID has served the cause of electoral uh, integrity. Uh, prior to 1985, elections in Northern Ireland were notoriously corrupt, characterised by high levels of impersonation, among many other abuses, all of them rooted in the fraud sectarian politics of the province. The popular phrase, vote early and vote often, had, re had real purchase. But voter ID has, along with other measures, helped to reduce this. Nonetheless, it's impossible to separate the issue of electoral reform uh, from the play of partisan interest. Simply put, veric verificatory measures have indeed been used to make voting more difficult and above all for marginal groups. Uh, groups who are marginal, whether by virtue of their poverty or their race or their religious or political views. Now looked at uh, uh, um, over the long term, of course, taking an oath is a different kind of activity to simply displaying a piece of ID. But still, the effect uh, can be much the same. To create an environment which places burdens on voters and treats them with suspicion, and indeed, in some cases, outright uh, hostility. We still know too little uh, about the effects of oath taking in the past. Uh, they seem to have been most exclusionary in revolutionary France simply because they were demanded of all voters in the context of a mass franchise. By contrast, we know much more about the manipulation of electoral registration systems, and especially in the case of the US, where manipulating electoral registration systems could be brutally uh, effective. By 1900, uh, the percentage of African-American males able to vote had been reduced <coughs> to below 5% in southern states such as Louisiana and Alabama. What finally of compulsory ID systems? In the US, voter ID laws are overwhelmingly Republican measures. Of the 35 states that currently have them, some 27 are Republican controlled, and Republicans have always been their principal cheerleaders, despite scant evidence of personation. Their effect in terms of voter suppression is, is, is more difficult to discern, but some analysts have concluded that they have reduced turnout by anything between 1 and 3%, and principally among African, and American, and Hispanic voters. Quite whether voter ID will have the same effect in British elections, of course, remains to be seen. The evidence from Northern Ireland, uh, like a handful of pilot studies in Britain, suggests that it uh, will lead to a minor decrease in turn. But as I say, that remains to be seen. However, critics are surely right to question the necessity of the measure given the minuscule scale of the problem uh, itself. There was just one conviction of personation in the general election in 2017 out of 30 million votes cast. Let us end with a uh, general point, and it's simply this, that any history of the secret ballot needs to be an embedded and networked 
history, which is to say that this crucial electoral technology needs to be grasped as part of a greater assemblage of shifting, interacting uh, practices dating from the inception of mass franchises in the 19th century. And among them, as we've suggested, are those relating to the verification of an elector's credentials. So much and good afternoon colleagues. It's my great pleasure to speak with you and to uh, share a panel with so many <coughs> distinguished speakers. And uh, we're here of course to mark the 150th anniversary of the introduction of secret voting in Britain, but it's an opportune time to consider how and why it came about and why it was adopted so rapidly throughout the Anglophone world from the mid to late 19th century to the point where today's secret voting is considered so necessary to a democratic society that it's explicitly endorsed in section 21 of the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The first point to be made is that secret voting did not begin in Australia. In the 19th century, secret voting was actually a tautology. It was usually called simply the ballot. The secrecy was implied and in opposition to open voting the uh, etymology of the word is uh, balotta, Italian, uh, for the coloured balls that were used in secret voting in uh, practices that go back to ancient Rome, and appeals to uh, the Roman Republic and uh, Athenian democracy were common when pushing for secret voting. And for just one example, the reforming MP for Bristol, we've already uh, heard of, uh, Francis uh, Barclay, who up until now, I've been saying Berkeley, so thanks, uh, Martin, <laughs> for uh, benefited from hearing your uh, speech. Uh, anyway, uh, when he gave a speech in favour of it in 1848, uh, uh, the title page had a quote from Cicero. And in the 18th and 19th centuries, Massachusetts, New Brunswick, and other places had already experimented with versions of secret voting before 1856. So Australia neither invented it nor was the first place <coughs> to implement it. Rather, a specific type of voting was pioneered in Australia. And uh, the image on the left is from a four-part series of uh, William Hogarth Oils, uh, finished in 1755, simply titled An Election, a stinging critique of British elections. Uh, Hogarth uh, depicts them as corrupt, violent, inebriated affairs, and in this particular painting, the infirmed, the insane, and even the dead. Uh, being brought forth to vote, uh, while a symbolic coach representing Britannia falls apart in the background. So, not a subtle metaphor. If you'd like to see it, incidentally, it hangs not far from here in the St. John uh, Sohn Museum. This contrasts sharply with the second image from Melbourne, although it's uh, actually from a Victorian election in 1880. It's a good visual of the key features of the Australian version of secret voting, which was introduced in Victoria in 1856. Firstly, the government would provide an official ballot paper, and secondly, some kind of private compartment was provided for the voter. In 1996, the poet Les Murray published a uh, poem called My Ancestors and the Secret Ballot, and it outlines the problems uh, with voting in the early 19th century and finishes with this line, the polling booth will be a closet of prayer. <laughs> and that's quite appropriate imagery as many of the advocates of secret voting spoke in almost religious terms of the sacredness <coughs> of the vote and that this was uh, a chance for moral advancement. After its introduction in Victoria, one Irish observer noted the contrast with Britain uh, and he said, there an elector would run a desperate gauntlet through corruption, drunkenness, violence, and uproar. Whereas here, he suggested, uh, here in Australia, um, a voter walks through a smooth private avenue. Uh, that's a lovely image there for you. So these two innovations, today generally taken for granted, are what 
differentiates the Australian version of secret voting, and this is the version that was pioneered in Victoria in 1856, hence rising to international fame as the Victorian ballot or the Australian ballot, and I found one record in the US of it being called kangaroo voting, which I thought was cute. Uh, due to some fabulous scholarship by Terry Newman, we now know that Tasmania also introduced it in 1856. Anything from the early 2000s or before will have Tasmania as 1858, uh, which is when New South Wales introduced it incidentally, and Queensland has had it uh, in place from uh, 1859. So why was the development of the Australian ballot significant? The short answer is because other attempts at secret voting weren't overly secret. New York, for instance, had secret voting in 1856 as well, but it was a very different affair. And you can see this image. Uh, there's a stand for James Buchanan, who would win the election for the Democrats, uh, John Fremont, representing the newly formed Republicans, and Millard Fillmore for the Whigs, uh, who the Republicans splintered from. An eligible voter would go up to the booth for their preferred candidate and take a piece of paper, which usually would be coloured, uh, with, um, and there was no laws about the size or the shape of the paper either. So they could, of course, fold it uh, and hide it in their hand if they wanted it, but if they were being coerced or bribed, uh, it also was very easy to sort of wave a coloured piece of paper and people would know who you were secretly voting for. And this was one of the great evils reformers in the US and the UK wanted to eliminate, especially as the male franchise extended, the practice of treating was a concern where uh, basically candidates are bribed, um, uh, enfranchised but disinterested voters with beer or liquor. The Australian ballot was not innovative in a desire to be secret, but it provided a more effective mechanism, namely the government printed ballot uh, paper that's given to voters, and the private room, and those are the original features of the Victorian legislation. But if the mechanics of effective secret voting were pioneered in Australia, the case for it can be traced to the English radical tradition before Australia was colonised. We've heard a fair bit about that already this morning. And while Australian politicians and sometimes historians try to claim the introduction of secret voting as an Australian achievement, uh, and at a smaller level, there's state rivalry between Victoria and South Australia as to who should really get the credit. Uh, the story of the ballot is transnational, and it reveals a vibrant exchange of political ideas in the British world, in particular, and the English-speaking world uh, more generally. Uh, and it might be stressed that for the 19th century colonists, Britishness was transportable and framing secret voting as an Australian achievement would be anachronistic to those who introduced it. Although uh, it was half a century before Federation, the Australian New Zealand Gazette in 1854 referred to all the colonies which now make up those two countries collectively as the young England of the South. So secret voting along with uh, manhood and eventually universal suffrage can be seen as part of a suite of British democratic reforms <coughs> found fertile soil in Australia. The secret voting has a long history in the British imagination. In Thomas More's Utopia, the prince is elected by secret ballot. Uh, Twelve years before the first fleet arrived in Sydney in 1776, the great reformer John Cartwright argued for it in his pamphlet, Take Your Choice. Jeremy Bentham, the intellectual leader of the philosophical radicals, argued for it in the early 19th century, along with George Grote, uh, James Mill, though oddly enough his famous <coughs> son was against secret voting. But Bentham is perhaps the most influential individual voice, but as a movement, the significance of the Chartists uh, cannot be overstated. As the movement fizzled out in Britain after 1850, it took on a new life in Australia, and especially in Victoria after gold was discovered in 1851. There was a large migration of Britons to Australia even before gold was discovered. Some 200,000 arrived just between 1837 and 51, uh, which is uh, itself more than the total number of convicts uh, to come since 1788. But after gold was discovered, the population of Victoria increased sevenfold in a decade, from 77,000 to over half a million, 
and included in that were many charters bringing their political ideas with them. And there's particular <coughs> evidence uh, that, of that in the leadership of the Ballarat Reform League. And of particular note is Edward Hawksley and George Black, both Nottingham Chartists who founded the People's Advocate in New South Wales and the Gold Diggers Advocate in Victoria, respectively. So cutting a long story short, there was a democratic zeitgeist in the mid-19th century, and following the Eureka Rebellion in 1854, there was a palpable sense that Victoria was the place for a democratic experiment, and that secret voting seemed to go hand in hand with the rapidly expanding male franchise. South Australia, Victoria, New South Wales, and Queensland all had male suffrage and secret voting by 1859, and by 1889, all four also had paid MPs, and uh, all of this is some decades before the UK. The arguments for secret voting in Australia were much the same as those in Britain. The image of electoral violence in Charles Dickens' uh, Pickwick Papers would have seemed real enough to Australian readers as it did to those in the UK. Secret voting was seen as a solution for the drunkenness and violence associated with elections, and especially as a working class consciousness developed uh, as an avenue to avoid exploitation and coercion. And for a number of reasons, Britain's Australian colonies seem like the ideal place for a democratic laboratory to try out new ideas being resisted in the motherland. Victoria and New South Wales were drafting new constitutions under responsible government in the early 1850s. The violence of the Eureka stockade had given a, the reform agenda a sense of urgency. Indeed, Karl Marx, uh, perhaps optimistically, predicted there was going to be a Victorian revolution. And the influx of Chartists and other radical thinkers during the gold rush, combined with a, the absence of an established aristocracy, created ideal conditions for a political experiment. And most importantly, the experiment worked. On 4 October 1856, the Adelaide Observer gloated that the opponents of the ballot in Victoria are discreetly silent, and we have no doubt the opponents of the ballot in this colony will be after that system has had a trial. We are not surprised that the ballot should have succeeded in the sister colony, nor shall we express any astonishment when its successors may be among ourselves. A brilliant triumph is the ballot, so says the Argus, so says the Herald, so says the Age, so says the Australian Punch, so says everybody. The uh, violence and drunkenness that had marked open voting occasions, and we'll hear more about that violence uh, from Gary, I think, in the next uh, panel, had been replaced by a relatively peaceful event, and arguably this transformation had some role then in New South Wales and Australia, South Australia in particular, being the first places to extend voting rights to women. While the success of the Australian ballot is sometimes presented as a matter of national pride, it reveals a two-way exchange of political ideas. And uh, indeed, the three men most responsible for pioneering the Australian version of the secret ballot, William Nicholson, Henry Chapman, and William Boothby, were all born in England. Chapman, in particular, really epitomised the exchange of ideas and people around the 19th century British world. He was born in London, educated in Kent, was a merchant in Quebec, and a disciple of the philosophical radicals. He returned to England to campaign for the reformer John Roebuck, returned to Canada to found the Montreal Daily Advertiser. He was a uh, witness to the election violence in Lower Canada, which would eventually culminate in the Republican rebellions of 1837 and 8. He published a book sympathetic uh, to the French Canadians, and this period really firmed in his mind the importance of secret voting. Uh, he returned to England again, published a seven-point radical charter in Robock's uh, Pamphlets of the People, which uh, anticipated the Chartist program, and worked with John Stuart Mill on the London Review. Well, obviously, he couldn't change his mind about secret voting. Uh, he was called to the bar in 1840, became a judge in Wellington, New Zealand the following year, the colonial secretary for Van Diemen's Land, uh, turned down the governorship of the West Indies, was elected to the Victorian Legislative Council in 1855. He drafted the secret ballot legislation that Premier William Nicholson would introduce. So an extraordinary career by any measure, and a very British Empire one. 
As uh, Premier Nichols took much of the credit for the successful introduction of secret voting, and because Victoria was the first place to use this version, uh, the term Victorian ballot, uh, uh, but then when it spread to other colonies uh, internationally, the Australian ballot, uh, especially in the US, and it's worth noting there are papers in the US from the 1880s which would specifically point which states use the Australian ballot versus which states use secret voting. So clearly they were seen as different things uh, back then. As the architect of the version of secret voting used in most democracies today, perhaps it would be more fitting to call it the Chapman ballot rather than the Australian ballot. And as you can see from his long career, very much an empire man, and his ideas were shaped uh, in uh, many places. Along with Nichols uh, and the influential South Australian, Louis Bookesby, the men who pioneered the Australian ballot were not just influenced by Britain, they were part of the British world. And similarly, several members of Prime Minister Gladstone's Liberal government who advocated for the secret ballot had spent time in Australia. And uh, we've already uh, heard about uh, Hugh Childers, the member of Pontefract, uh, who lived in Victoria during those crucial years of 1850. 57, while Robert Torrens, the member of Cambridge, not only lived in South Australia, he was elected to their legislative assembly by secret ballot. Uh, and of course it wasn't just a <coughs> two-way exchange either. This is a transnational network of political ideas in the Anglophone world. Uh, I'm very conscious of trying to say the Anglophone world, the, the French as well, and uh, influences from all over the world. Uh, but this is what, uh, particularly in the Anglophone world, I suppose, is what's caused its rapid succession in New Zealand in 1870, the UK in 72, Canada in 74, and most of the United States in the 1880s and 90s. Uh, so if I can intrude on your patience for a, a little bit longer, I'm conscious of the time, uh, I'll just end with these observations that the introduction of the Chapman ballot, um, if we now call it that, uh, Although the secret ballot was undoubtedly a goal of English radicals and a liberal government brought it in, it seems that support from conservatives was crucial. As the franchise widened, the concerns that bosses and landlords would coerce workers and tenants to vote a certain way, conservatives were worried that the growing trade union movement could manipulate votes in the other direction. The successful implementation in 1872 was helped by a survey of Australian colonial governors in late 1870, all of whom happened to be former Conservative MPs. In Tasmania, it was Charles Duquesne, who had been the uh, Tory MP from North Essex, and it was his judgment that the Australian ballot secures perfect uh, order and tranquility. And James Ferguson, the South Australian governor, who had also been a Tory MP, agreed. And significantly, both had voted against the ballot. So uh, every year when Barclay would introduce it, they would always vote no. So their conversion was directly based <coughs> on their time in Australia. And that would have had a real impact, I suggest, on other Conservative MPs. So to conclude, the influence of the Victorian example and the other eastern states on Britain and in the US is clear. To again quote from Les Murray's poem, in those sunburnt colonies, in more than one mind, how to repair the ballots been divined. But the instigators of the reform certainly would have considered themselves to be British, and they drew on a radical tradition from Britain. The contribution of the Australian colonies is important, but it's part of a larger transnational story of the secret ballot, which is now, of course, a global phenomenon. Thank you. Okay, uh, the final speaker on the panel is Dr. Anthony Malkopoulou, who is a senior lecturer in political theory at Lund and Uppsala universities. Her first book is The History of Compulsory Voting in Europe, and she has a forthcoming book on the theories of democratic self defense. So thank you for the introduction. Thank you very much uh, uh, to the organizers for inviting me. And uh, thank you really to everyone for being here. I'm very happy to share my work with you. So uh, this uh, presentation is not on the secret ballot. 
so it's on compulsive voting as you saw in your in your programs. But I hope that you can draw the uh, you can draw conclusions and make comparisons about how it is relevant, which I think it is. So today, compulsory voting is mostly associated with um, Australia or South America. In Europe, there are only very few countries that uh, practice it, and only Belgium really enforces it. Uh, in the past, uh, it has been mostly abolished by other countries, and briefly discussed, but with no success in many others. But this picture is not representative of the long history that compulsory voting has had in Europe, both in theory and in practice. So as a theoretical concept, the obligation to vote links back to key European political ideas established in the 19th century. And these were not only the product of European pens and voices, but they also came about because of specific socio-political circumstances that existed in Europe at the time. In terms of practice, a wide variety of possibilities have been tried out in Europe. The most common types of punishments for abstainers were by fine or public shaming, depending on who was eligible to vote or whom the obligation concerned, these laws could take a very different scope from a very democratic to a very aristocratic one. Hence, despite the positive of European laws and procedures about compulsory voting today, the European continent has had a long experience in penalizing abstention. So to illustrate the richness of this European experience, my presentation will focus on select instances that were key for establishing compulsory voting in Europe. I uh, will pay less attention to politics around specific election reforms or the technical aspects of such re reforms because my interest has been <laughs> Uh, always uh, uh, on the concepts and discourses um, how compulsory voting was argued for by Europeans uh, at the time when it was gaining momentum in the continent. So how was the institution publicly justified? Which principles and norms supported uh, introducing such a measure? And which problems or risks was compulsory voting expected to address? So I examined these questions through an analysis of uh, Francophone debates, which are by far the most eloquent and voluminous on this issue. Uh, they were circulating in France and Belgium between 1870 and 1930. So from this plethora of arguments for and against compulsory voting during this period, there are four that stand out in quantity and quality. The first two, voting duty, and democracy, so democratic education through voting. I will unfortunately skip over uh, because in my mind they're more intrinsically linked to the philosophy and politics of their time. And I focus, I will focus my attention in this talk on the two arguments that I consider more relevant for contemporary discussions since I'm in political theory nowadays. And uh, one is representativeness, as you see in the title, and the other is moderation. Not only do we find support for these two ideas during many phases of the compulsory voting discourse and in different places, but they also offer a new appreciation of that institution today. So, first, essential idea that motivated many compulsory voting bills was too exact or accurate representation. Abstention created fake majorities and parliaments that were a false mirror of the country. So the logic behind this metaphor was this. For representative democracy to function well, the whole nation's will needed to be expressed. When some voices remained unheard, the general will was incomplete and thus essentially unknown. And thus, for representation to be true, everyone had to participate, even if this implied obliging them to do so. So as expressed by the Belgian Prime Minister, with um, abstention, the election results are not anymore, sorry, the, uh, the abstention, uh, quote, 
the election, that the election results are not anymore the true image of public opinion, the majority is, or at least may be, distorted, end of quote. So in France too, uh, the fear was that abstention produced a distorted mirror of public opinion. In essence, this court for undistorted representation expressed three different considerations. First, the interest in true representation was an indirect appeal against electoral corruption. In the second half of the 19th century, indeed, extensive discussions about voting malpractices took place and laws were introduced to stop it. For example, in 1867, Belgium criminalized election fraud and specifically vote buying, which was a widespread practice given the expansive journey that voters had to undertake to reach voting centers. To some extent, uh, compulsory voting debates were a continuation of these discussions. The main worry initially was not about political apathy, but about securing the integrity and independence of each vote vis-a-vis -vis pressures from rich employers and landlords. Abstention buying had indeed replaced vote buying as a technique of electoral fraud after the introduction of secret voting in 1877. But obliging everyone to vote would make it illegal for patronizing employers to pressure their employees to abstain. In other words, by punishing abstention, the law would prevent malicious agents from affecting who participates and who does not. And that, thus, it would guarantee the transparency of election procedures. That was the first concern. Second, the claim that representation had to be accurate <coughs> expressed a demand for reliable and credible election results. <coughs> that must be for uh, democratic legitimacy. Low participation rates created uncertainty about the general will and the tendency to issue controversial interpretations about who the large numbers of abstaining voters would have supported. This uncertainty harmed the dignity of electoral contests, caused ambiguity about the election results, and made them contestable by the political opposition. Indeed, it was not uncommon for elections in individual voting districts to be invalidated due to low participation. Abstention produced a vote, a vote, a vote that is insignificant, ridiculous, reduced to a relatively infinitesimal expression. End of quote. That's a French author who writes. The lack of confidence in election results undermined the morality and veracity of claims about the legitimacy of existing power, according to another French author. And as a result, the authority of elected representatives, the credibility of parliament, and the stability of government. Absent the votes of the entire people, what, what was the basis of popular rule? As put by French, a French author, in this case, quote, in this case, universal suffrage, the basis of the representative regime loses its sincerity. National representation is distorted. We cannot say that the people govern themselves." End of quote. So in addition to electoral, electoral integrity and legitimacy of the elected representatives, a third related consideration that underlined calls for accurate representation had to do with the commitment to majority rule. <coughs> political forces constituted a majority and which a minority should not depend on abstention rates, but on a, should, it should correspond to a real division of power within the electorate, to real numerical majorities and minorities. Otherwise, majorities were, again, called accidental, surprising, and hazardous. The real problem, of course, was that without full participation, small parties and minorities could become parliamentary majorities. Uh, indeed, abstention was advantageous for small parties with a loyal support base, 
compared to bigger parties with less enthusiastic voters who are loosely organized voter base. In the 1920s, a French parliamentarian and sponsor of Bill uh, Barthelemy, Joseph Barthelemy, was explicit about who these parties were. This is that of bourgeois democracy, socialists, and left radicals. It was feared that by benefiting from the abstention of large numbers of voters, such Davies parties would dominate the electoral process and take over the state through dirty strategic tricks. Winning power would then embolden them and give them a license to increase their violence. Ultimately, abstention would lead to the victory of factional or turbulent minorities, to political instability, and even tyranny and dictatorship. In other words, abstention damaged not only electoral integrity and democratic legitimacy, as we saw earlier, but also political stability. And this brings me to the second major argument that we see um, throughout history and across the board also. Less radicalism. Preventing the overrepresentation of malicious minorities lay bare the fact that European supporters of compulsory voting were motivated by political considerations. And public would have been naive to sponsor a voting reform without taking into account its effects in restructuring the political landscape. Compulsory voting was a way to increase the electoral voice of some parties and prevent the rise of others. More specifically, it was a preemptive strike against political parties and movements. At the end of the 19th century, the number one political challenge was no other than the rise of the labor movement. For example, the Belgian Workers' Party was due to participate in elections for the first time in 1894, a year after the reform that introduced compulsory voting in Belgium. Likewise, in 1892, socialists had managed to win seats in local elections in France, while the closely related Republican movement had by then established itself as the leading political force. This defeat of French conservatism, especially in the early 1870s, was being attributed to low participation rates. The main reason behind it was supposed to be a fanatic political opposition, radical zealots who showed up at the polls enthusiastically and in great numbers. Radical and socialist voters did not outnumber moderate voters, but had a higher record of participation. Uh, although from an ideological point of view, they opposed parliamentar parliamentarism and bourgeois democracy, socialists were allegedly using elections as a strategic tool to take control of the establishment. Uh, especially in the early 20th century, after the triumph of socialism in Russia, they voted in large numbers and mobilized through a well-organized political network. Because of the socialist excessive participation, abstention of the general, presumably non-socialist population had significant effects on the electoral results. Conversely, abstainers were consistently depicted as voters of moderate convictions peaceful people who loved order and stability and did not blindly follow partisan command, as assumedly the Socialist Party some state. They had a distaste for revolution, violence, and hostility, and instead wanted to, to defend family, property, country. Because they were immune to political passions, the intensity of electoral antagonism pushed them off. In the words of uh, uh, the same French famous supporter of compulsory voting, but in me, moderation, uh, quote, moderation, common sense, the right balance, do not entrap. The moderate man stands aside from political struggles. He also tends to stay away from the force. End of quote. Uh, thus, abstention was explained as an effect of the moderate, mild idiosyncrasy, especially when confronted with the socialist ideological attack on parliamentarism and political aggressiveness. But we find the same rationale, the compulsory voting 
would inhibit the political advance of radicals, not only among French and Belgian conservatives, but also among moderate Republicans who were preoccupied about the radical left. Uh, the, uh, the more serious drive of potential Republican voters away from the polls was caused by intentional and systematic election boycotts organized by anarchists. Already in 1863, one of the founding fathers of anarchism, Pierre Joseph Couton, famously declared abstention to be a citizen's sacred duty. In Octave Fort, famous pamphlet, La Grève des électeurs, literally, the voters strike. Universal suffrage was not only a lie, it actually blocked human activity and compromised personal liberty. Like anarchists, revolutionary syndicalists also condemned parliamentary institutions and elections as an organized bourgeois deception of the workers. Universal suffrage, they argued, was designed to create a fake sense of equality in the absence of real, that is, material equality. Last but not least, in addition to anarchists and syndicalists, election participation was also threatened by radical right-wing polemics of representation, especially in the interwar years. This included fascists and national socialists who declared voting and parliamentarism to be overestimated while the real value of democracy lied elsewhere. In the work of Karl Schmitt, for example, election procedures and majoritarianism were um, liberal individualist corruptions of popular self-rule, which should emerge through the identification of the people with the leader. Other ultra-right authors were less critical of electoral principles, but le legitimized voting abstention per se by claiming that it is only natural for the masses to be apathetic and irresponsible in need of guidance by charismatic leadership. From this perspective, it was better if only those who were self-motivated, knowledgeable, and cared about their general interest to participate. The indifferent masses, through their abstention, set in motion a process of natural selection of the best voters, whose opinion was the only one that should count, according to another country in 1931. The circulation of such elitist ideas in the interwar years were presumably influencing citizens' decisions to stay away from the polls. Punishing abstention was then a way to resist such elitist critiques of mass participation. It is therefore not surprising that um, French pro-democratic parties almost adopted compulsory voting in 1922 and 1932 as a way to counteract abstentionism and radicalization. Um, hence the idea that compulsory voting creates obstacles to political radicalism has had a historical justification in the European context. From the, from the middle of the 19th century until at least the interval times, the legal obligation to vote was primarily conceived as a countermeasure to the excessive mobilization of socialist and radical voters. Moderate voters were not as passionate about participation and needed to be nudged to vote. This proved to be well calculated in the case of Belgium, where compulsory voting combined with plural suffrage stopped the newly enfranchised workers from making significant gains in 1894. In addition to that, compulsory universal suffrage was conceptualized as a direct response to radical right and left polemics of electoral representation. It was going to produce governance based on a wide and wide electoral participation and democratic legitimacy, as opposed to fascist and authoritarian visions of strong leadership. It was also going to challenge the anarchist and syndicalist strategy of election boycotting by making it illegal. At the end, support for compulsory voting became a proxy for protecting majoritarian rule from radical minorities who benefited from mass abstention. Uh, compulsory, so, uh, okay, compulsory voting gained momentum in Europe at the turn of the 20th century for reasons that are not widely discussed today. 
uh, and concern about abstention buying and the unreliability of electoral results and the overrepresentation of minorities drove up its support in several European countries. In addition to Belgium and France, similar debates took place in Greece and the Netherlands. Uh, a consistent mo motive in all cases was the preoccupation that radical parties would benefit from large-scale abstention and gain parliamentary seats. But in reality, these parties had support from only a small, small fraction of the electorate. The ascendancy of radical over moderate forces would then destabilize democracy and even lead to an increase in political violence. So what does the European discourse and experience of compulsory voting teach us? On the one hand, compulsory voting <coughs> increases representation as it makes legislatures representative of the views of a wider set of citizens. On the other hand, it prevents the overrepresentation of minorities that put forward subversive, often anti democratic claims. In a nutshell, obliging everyone to vote produces more representation and less radicalism. Also, it was argued in Europe before World War II. Thank you.